Okay, I think we can get started. Welcome everyone to this session, which is the final the finalist presentation for the outstanding research on development. Uh, I'm Francesco Bino, I'm head of programs at the Global Development Network, and very happy to, to be here to chat the session. Um, as, as most of you know, the ORD award <clears throat> is part of the Global Development Awards competition, which is uh, one of the actually GDN's longest standing program um, running since 2000. Um, in fact, we'll be celebrating the 20 years of this competition, which actually um, was scheduled for last year, but the prison was, was postponed to this year. We'll be celebrating that tomorrow, uh, um, 2 p.m. Uh, Central European time. Uh, when we'll also announce the winners of uh, under all categories of, of the awards uh, um, for, for this year. Um, this is a competition that was launched so in 2000, <clears throat> thanks to the general support of the Ministry of Finance, um, Government of Japan, and um, of the World Bank, uh, currently the PHOD Trust Fund. Uh, we've been distributing over 4 million, uh, 4.2 million US dollars uh, in research projects in grants reaching out to, to about 9,000 um, researchers and practitioners across uh, across developing um, countries. Uh, this is a very unique uh, competition because it has two categories. One category is um, dedicated to implementation projects. So we actually award uh, innovative um, development projects run by NGOs and, and accompany them into towards the scale up of a project. Um, but we also have a research category, of course, which is very close to uh, the agenda, the mandate of the Global Development Network. And this is the Outstanding Research on Development Award, um, of which we are we're running the finals um, today. Um, there are three finalists and three prizes. Uh, um, the first prize uh, winner uh, will get uh, 30,000 US dollars. The second prize winner will get 10,000 US dollars. And the third prize winner will get 5,000 um, US dollars to not only to, to in recognition of the quality of the project, but also to implement the research project themselves. Um, and during this final, we'll, we'll, have, uh, we'll have a presentation of the three finalists, and then uh, soon after the jury meeting, uh, the jury will meet to decide uh, to assign um, the prizes. Um, this is the end of a very uh, long and, 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 and uh, articulate selection process. Uh, we had overall kind of over 100 uh, applications for the competition this year. For the research category, all, all proposals uh, go through an eligibility screening done by GDN, uh, um, and then they go through two levels of review, by, by first by young researchers and second by, by senior researchers, who then identify three finalists who are invited um, to present after attending a communications training offered by, by GDN. These proposals are evaluated against the criteria you see on the screen. So, of course, we look for a substantive contribution to research in a particular aspect, which is that de detailed in the call um, for the award that changes every year. But we're looking also at uh, um, interesting or, or innovative approaches to, to, to methodology, uh, um, clarity, of course, and, and thinking about the policy implication, potential policy implication of the projects, and of course, the feasibility of, of the projects in terms of um, the resources, the human resources and, 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 and budget allocation um, proposed. Uh, we also give some importance to the quality of the presentation during this, this finals, of course. Uh, um, we all today have a, a, a very, very interesting uh, jury, uh, four people jury. Um, so we have, of course, um, Professor Izumi, Izumi Ono. Um, and let me just pull up your bio. Izumi Ono is a professor at the National Grader Institute for Policy Studies, GRIPS, in Japan and a senior research advisor to the Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA, Ogata Sadoko Research Institute for Peace and Development. She also served as director of JICA Ogata Research Institute during 2018, uh, between 2018 and 2020. She specializes in international development policy, industrial development cooperation, and business and development. Prior to joining GRIPS, she worked at JICA, the World Bank, and the Japan Bank for International Cooperation, uh, GBIC. Um, welcome, uh, Onosan. We're very happy to, to have you again on the jury of, of the ORD. 
Um, and we have a, a, a very good acquaintance of GN, of course, Professor Alan Winters, uh, Professor of Economics at the University of Sussex, uh, founding director of the UK Trade Policy Observatory, um, and, and formerly chief economist of the UK Department of, uh, for International Development um, between 2008 and 2011. He was also director of, development, uh, of the Development Research Group of the World Bank between 2004 and 2007, and editor of the World Trade Review. Uh, between 2009 and 2020. Um, of course, I should mention, he, he, you know, Alan was also the chairman of the board uh, of directors of GDN between 2011 and 2017. He's a leading specialist on the empirical and policy analysis of international trade, including that of Europe and of developing countries, and his personalization is, is precisely uh, the reason he is, is, uh, is with us today. Uh, welcome, Alan, and, and great to see you again. Um, the third um, juror is uh, Mr. Elpidio Peria, um, who graduated uh, um, in, in BS Fisheries with a major in fisheries, business management and law for, from the University of the Philippines in Diliman. Um, he, he also then later did a master's in technology management from the uh, University of Philippine Technology Management Center. Um, he was previously a program specialist at the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity between 2018 and 2019, where he managed a program involving ASEAN member states of a traditional knowledge, including a project on biodiversity based products. He continues to work at the um, ASEAN Center for Biodiversity as a technical consultant and, and is working on the center strategy on biodiversity mainstreaming and how it may be implemented in various sectors, uh, preparing for the CBD negotiations um, that are set to happen in April 2022. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome, uh, El Pidio. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. Last but not least, we have uh, Marianne uh, Ketunen, I uh, hope I'm not mispronouncing your name, uh, um, who is a Senior Policy Advisor and Head of Partnerships at the Forum on Trade, Environment and the SDGs. Um, her role at TESS, the Forum on, on Trade, Environment and the SDGs, is to provide strategic leadership and policy advice on several thematic issues central um, to more sustainable trade, including biodiversity, natural resources and sustainable agriculture, as well as circular economy and climate change. Um, before this, she worked in a number of institutions, including UNEP, UNPD, uh, UNCTAD, IUCN, the World Bank, European Commission and Parliament, national governments and international think tanks and um, an NGO. Uh, um, welcome uh, as well and, and thank you very much for, for, for joining us um, today. Um, introduction are done. I'd like to, to propose uh, to move to the presentation of the three finalists and the projects. Um, we'll start with um, Abdullah Nan uh, Abdullah, who's uh, a lecturer at the University of Development Studies in Ghana, who will present the research proposal titled Implication of Large Scale Agricultural Investment on Biodiversity Evidence from Mixed Method Study of Farm Households in North, um, in North Ghana. I will stop sharing my screen so that we can share this presentation. And um, Abdul, you have 15 minutes, and which will be followed by 10 minutes of, of discussion. The floor is yours. You can unmute yourself. In the meanwhile, I think Joao is going to pull up your presentation. Perfect. You can see the presentation. Um, and Abdullah, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, good morning from Ghana. My name is Abdullah Abdullah Hanan, and I'm presenting a proposal on um, large scale implications of large scale agricultural investment on biodiversity, evident from mixed method study of households in northern Ghana. Um, Large scale agricultural investment is um, a trade related uh, um, activity, and we are looking at its impacts on biodiversity. So, this, to my uh, knowledge, is places our study within the, uh, this year's uh, um, theme of international trade and biodiversity. Our outline of presentation is uh, 
we'll start with introduction through to policy implication. Next slide, please. Um, international trade plays a significant role in sustainable development. For instance, it, uh, it reduces uh, poverty uh, and hunger. It, uh, it helps in decent uh, work and economic growth, and as well as promotion of responsible uh, consumption and production through the uh, principles of responsible agricultural uh, investment. Um, and this has been uh, confirmed by empirical studies. For instance, Winters and Madsule and then Zul, uh, Zul et al. both uh, argue that international trade plays a significant role in uh, sustainable development goals. And one such uh, uh, international related activity is large scale agricultural investment. Um, this large scale agricultural investment, uh, like international trade, promotes sustainable development such as a reduction of hunger and poverty, and as well as promotion of decent economic growth and uh, uh, um, decent economic growth and decent work. And like um, large scale, like, like uh, international trade, large scale agricultural investment is financed by external government to strengthen bilateral trade ties with other countries and as well as promote exports of goods and services. <laughs> Next slide, please. However, whilst large scale agricultural investment promotes such benefits, it also has um, implications for peace, livelihood, environmental, uh, for environmental uh, environment, and biodiversity. For instance, um, it has been noted that most people usually label large scale agricultural investment as land grabbing. And based on such labeling, um, protestations are usually uh, seen. Also, large scale agricultural investment. Uh, activities of large scale agricultural investment can lead to uh, air pollution and air and water pollution, and as well as destruction of forests, which serve as a habitat for most living organisms. Next slide, please. However, whilst the implication of large scale agricultural investment on um, livelihoods, um, food security, and other uh, outcomes has been investigated, its implications on life on biodiversity is very scanty in the empirical literature. Um, for instance, the Food and Agriculture Organization noted that large-scale agricultural investment causes 40% of forest conversion in the tropics and subtropics. Um, Ajala also noted that the type of crops and monoculture practices adopted by large-scale agricultural investors usually lead to deforestation. And then um, Mbaya also noted that new varieties usually introduced by large-scale agricultural investors will lead to reduction of genetic diversity because uh, increase in new varieties uh, does not uh, necessarily translate to increase in genetic pool. It, however, so yet um, implications of large-scale agriculture investment on biodiversity has not been uh, studied, despite these uh, evidences. It is against this backdrop that this study has been proposed to investigate the effects of large-scale agriculture investment on biodiversity. Next slide, please. Next slide. Large-scale agricultural investment affect by that large scale agricultural investment is very critical for food security and other livelihood. For instance, Ketunen and Brink uh, noted the importance of uh, um, large scale agriculture, noted the importance of biodiversity, uh, uh, biodiversity uh, ecosystem management practices on um, livelihoods. However, this large scale, uh, and this implies that um, any uh, issue or economic issue that affects biodiversity will consequently affect uh, food security and sustainable development. One such issue is large-scale agricultural investment. For instance, this uh, issue or this large-scale agricultural investment increased following the 2007-2008 uh, multiple crisis. And this is reflected in the number of lands that has been acquired for such investment. For instance, um, between 2000, between in, in by 2010, global acquisitions of land for large scale agricultural investment increased to 67 million hectares. And out of this 67 million hectares, 3 million hectares came from Africa, whilst 52, uh, 452,000 came from um, Ghana, where this study is to be conducted. This increase generated mixed uh, concerns among development practitioners. For instance, 
as you noted that large scale agricultural investment will always decrease food security while the ninga and the world bank noted that large scale agricultural investment has the potential to uh, increase development as it will increase uh, job creation in response to this uh, uh, mix or conflicting views uh, empirical studies investigated large scale agricultural investment and its implication on local occupants however next slide please please However, um, questions regarding how large-scale agriculture investment impact on biodiversity are not answered, despite the relevance of such information for policy uh, take-up. Also, results from uh, studies on large-scale agriculture investment are often mixed, and we do not, we do not know whether such uh, uh, results are also applicable to the uh, biodiversity implication of, of large-scale agricultural investment. Also, mixed methods study design is not employed in most of the empirical studies even though such a uh, methodology could be very relevant in providing in-depth information of the implications of large-scale agricultural investment on biodiversity uh, to fill these gaps this study seeks to explore questions on the implication of large-scale agricultural investment using um, mixed method design and northern ghana as the key study specifically three questions will be explored the first is what is the process of land acquisition for large-scale agricultural investment what are the sizes and the actors involved in large-scale agricultural investment what is the impact of large-scale agricultural investment on species richness and evenness what are the implications of large-scale agricultural investment on access to ecosystem services and biodiversity management practices in northern ghana next slide please and these uh, research questions are translated into these objectives next slide please um, usually, studies conducted on large-scale agricultural investment revolves around two narratives. The first narrative is the new colonialism narrative, which argues that acquisition for large-scale agricultural investment are land grabbing and has negative impact on local or community. The second view is the development optimism narrative, which argues that acquisition for large-scale agricultural investment are foreign direct investment in agriculture and can provide benefit for all parties involved, including investors, the chiefs, and then the uh, host government. Next slide slide please um this um, study will be conducted in um, northern ghana which consists of five uh, main regions the including upper west upper east the northern region which is further divided into three uh, more regions that is the northern region itself the um the northeast region and the savannah region this area covers an area of uh, seven over seventy thousand kilometers square and it is usually managed by two systems of land governance. The first is the traditional system and the second is the, um, the, second is the state. And these uh, systems of land governance usually comes with challenges. And these challenges are explored by investors to establish large-scale agricultural investment in northern Ghana. Examples include Biofuel Africa and the rest. Next slide, please. Um, usually, studies on large-scale agricultural investment are, uh, are very complex and needs methodologies that will provide in-depth understanding of the issue at stake. So for this reason, we are applying multi-phase mixed method design in the um, in collection of data and analysis. The first, this includes first phase key informant interviews where two to 10 participants, officials from MOFA, um, Ministry of Food and Agriculture, and other stakeholders who are involved in large scale agricultural investment will be selected and interviewed using interview guide and responses will be recorded using tape recorder and notebooks. Analysis will be conducted using descriptive analysis, whilst um, our expected results will be coded teams, frequencies, and percentages. Then based on the coded teams and the frequency, the most coded teams will be selected and um, questions will be generated for household survey, which is the second phase of the study. And here, 1,000 households from 240,000 to 238 agricultural households will be selected. And semi-structured questionnaires will, with cover toolbox will be used uh, for collecting the data and analysis will be done using descriptive statistics and propensity score margin. Frequencies and percentages will be, and treatment effect will be the results for the household survey. Then, um, based on the results of the household survey, there might be some, so there might be some um, results that are unexpected and then focus group discussions will be conducted to explain the unexpected results. Hello, please. I can see my slides. Yes. Um, okay. Okay. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Now, the contribution of this. Next, 
The contribution of this study comes in three folds. The first is that questions of the effects of large-scale agriculture investment on biodiversity has not been explored. And this remains a knowledge gap that is yet to be filled. So this study will contribute to uh, will contribute to the to, to existing studies on the effects of large scale agriculture investment on biodiversity. The second is that major channels through which large scale agriculture investment affect biodiversity has not been explored extensively in Ghana. So, um, this, for instance, um, effects of large scale agriculture investment on species evenness and richness has not been explored in any study. So, this study will contribute in, in that direction. Lastly, the impacts of large-scale agriculture investment on livelihood have been generally inconclusive. For instance, Shite and Ruten found negative implications of such investment on food security, while Santagello found positive effects on such uh, um, investment on food security. Given this gen uh, mixed results, our study will therefore bring uh, a conclusion to this uh, um, impact. That is, determine whether exactly the effect of large-scale agriculture investment on biodiversity. Next slide, please. Uh, Abdul, you have three minutes and a half left. Okay, so the findings will come. The, the, the findings will help uh, policy policy in in several folds. First, it will contribute to the Ghana's Ministry of Food and Agriculture and last Commission policy documents on um, community investor guidelines for large scale transactions. It will also contribute to um, the Ghana Forest Policy and Wildlife Policy Ghana Forest and Wildlife Policy document, which talks about how to um, uh, how to um, uh, use um, uh, biodiversity in Ghana. Then the last will be, it will contribute to the ongoing land reforms in Ghana and other areas of Africa. Next slide, please. Um, our study is original and innovative in a sense that, um, to the best of our knowledge, no study has been conducted on the relationship between large-scale agriculture investment and biodiversity. So um, this study is the first to be conducted on such issue in Ghana. It is also innovative and uh, uh, original in a sense that it is the first to employ multi-phase mixed method design to investigate the effects of large-scale agriculture investment on biodiversity. Thank you so much. Next slide. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Abdul. That was uh, a quick run through and, and, and you still have a few minutes left, but um, thanks, thanks all for the presentation uh, uh, and apologies everyone. I, I skipped the most important slide uh, in my in my short intro, which is about the topic of, of the of this year's uh, or the competition. Uh, as you might have understood, we've asked uh, researchers from low income and middle income countries uh, to develop original research that throws light on uh, impact pathways that link international trade and biodiversity beyond, uh, of course, uh, green gas uh, house emissions, um, with the goal of better understanding uh, what can be done better or differently to protect or even promote uh, promote biodiversity. Um, so all three projects are addressing um, or expected to address uh, this this um, this question. Now I'd like to, for for jurors to switch on the video if, if you can. And, and, and please come in with any questions and, and comments uh, you might have. We have about 10, 12 minutes for, for comments and questions. Who would like to go first? I'm, Alan, please. I, I'm happy to. Uh, so thank you very much indeed, Abdel Hanan. It, I, I think it's a very interesting project. I've got two questions um, which are related. The first question, what exactly do you mean by biodiversity? And over what area would you say you're looking to find diversity? Do you want to, to, to Yes, that? I want to respond to that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Um, biodiversity here impl uh, refers to um, um, plant and animal life and as well as um, the species and um, um, diversity and ecosystem. Oh, yeah. Did we lose Abdul? It's or is it just me? No. Did the image froze for everyone or just me? Uh, no. It froze for, for me yeah. as well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's stuck, it's stuck. Mm -hmm. yeah. Doesn't he have a backup uh, from his team? Um, Azar, if you're still connected, can you just check if Abdul is still connected? Oh, 
Hmm. Let's just check quickly if it's still it's an issue with the platform or whether maybe he lost connectivity on his side. Okay. Doesn't sound like yeah, I think we we, we dropped. Uh, let's wait just half a minute to see whether he can reconnect because he they, uh, <clears throat> them before we move to the next. Or you can compile the questions first and then he'll answer it. Yeah, we can also compile the questions, but it'll be best for him to hear them from you rather than from me. <laughs> yeah, we try to maximize it. Half a minute because earlier something happened and they were able to reconnect uh, pretty quickly. So let's just give you 30 seconds and see. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next presentation and then we'll go back, get back to him with questions. Yeah, anyway, I suppose everybody has written down their questions. Mm, okay, I don't see him coming back. Let, let's. Uh, I propose we move on to the next um, presentation. So Chukwaka, um, I'll, I'll ask uh, jurors to you know note down your questions for uh, <clears throat> for Abdul, so that we can get back to him uh, as soon as he reconnects. <clears throat> Sorry. So, uh, Chukwaka, would you be able to uh, um, share your screen, unmute yourself, and and, and present uh, your project? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm trying to share my slides. Just a reminder, the project is called Evaluation of the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFSA, on Africa's Biodiversity. 15 minutes, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm trying to share my slides. We can see your screen. We can see your screen. Right. But if you go back to your presentation, because now we can see your, yeah. Trying to make your stuff on the, the first slide. We cannot see your screen anymore. Or you. This is the beauty of a, of a visual conference, of course. Joao, could you could you please uh, please pull up the, the presentation uh, for for uh, yeah okay. So Koka, can you please go ahead? We we share your presentation from our side. Hopefully, we have the latest version. In the show. Yes. Yes. Chukwaka? Yes. Chukwaka, you can, you can go ahead and you just tell me when to move the slides. Your slides, okay. I'm, I'm sharing them. The slides are on the screen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the title of um, my presentation is Evaluating the Effects of the African Continental Free Trade Area on Biodiversity. Uh, in Africa. So the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, area, it's um, it's one of the most topical issues in Africa now. Um, there's a lot of optimism in, in terms of how will it affect um, um, different economic uh, variables, how will it lead to economic uh, development, how will it create jobs, and how will it, um, you know, achieve the, the long-lasting pursuit for industrialization um, but now i'm putting we're trying to put in this angle of its effects on biodiversity and biodiversity uh, which has not been paid um, adequate attention so that's the focus of my presentation today next slide please. so in terms of outline um uh, we start uh, with an introduction mentioning uh, what are the potential uh, positive effects of um, the Africa continental free trade area? And, uh, and then I'll move to outlining, uh, pointing out the research uh, questions as well as objectives 
um, that will go to the methodology. And then I point out um, the, the innovativeness or originality of the research. I mentioned data sources and then I'll um, touch on policy implications and contributions. Next slide, please. So in the Africa Continental Free Trade is it's one of the it is, it's it's the biggest uh, free trade area in Africa um, in terms of size and participating countries. Uh, Africa has some um, good fundamentals in, in terms of um, intra-regional um, trade that needs to be explored and supported. Um, it's a continent of 1.26 billion people, uh, total GDP of 2.1 trillion. Um, I think we we lost Chukwaka. It's not a lack of session. It hadn't been as complicated earlier. In fact, it's the, full, the fourth session uh, with the finals. Oh, here he is back. Yes, please, please continue. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, so this uh, the free trade agreement that has been estimated uh, will lead to, even in the short to medium term, will lead to like a 3% increase in GDP of the continent, will increase the total of employment of 1.2%. Um, $16 billion welfare gains, and then uh, it's, it's, it's deemed to increase into Africa exports by 33% and also reduce 50% of the trade deficit um, of, of in Africa. Um, we need to understand the background to this is that Africa has been um, one of the continents with the lowest intra Africa. Uh, so regional integration has been weak, and um, a lot of this is because uh, we produce mostly primary goods uh, without much, uh, you know, going off the value chain and uh, developing uh, regional value chains. So this free trade agreement is supposed to provide us the opportunity to boost intra-Africa trade to a very high level, and also that will trickle down. Uh, to industrialization, job creation, um, strengthening regional value chains, as well as um, economic growth. So there's been a lot of optimism with um, this um, free trade agreement, which has um, just started being implemented um, in the start of the year. Next slide, please. Yeah, but um, an aspect that has not been looked at is how will this and you know, free trade area affect biodiversity. You know, biodiversity in terms of the variety of plants and animal life, which you know, it's um, desirable in terms of um, having you know a sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable kind of uh, of, of um, trade agreements. You know, it's it's, it's you know they've not paid there's not adequate attention being paid to how will this actually affect um biodiversity so um this is like a trying to conceptualize that effect by looking at the transmission um channel what the free trade area does is that it increases industrial production you know and um, it's also increased transportation because there will be a lot of movement you know, of um, goods in South Seas across different borders. Uh, there will be increasing energy use as well as land use and also with natural resources for exploration. These are going to increase. So these are the direct effects of, you know, if, uh, reducing tariffs, which is uh, what a free, uh, free trade area does. And then there are bound to be some negative effects in terms of climate change when there's Increase industrial production, um, it bound to lead to you know negative effects on climate change, pollution, uh, pressure on agricultural and species, uh, as well as wildlife. So these 
these is uh, the charts for short channel where um, this free trade area is bound to negatively affect biodiversity. Next slide, please. So this is what our study tends to uncover. Um, we ask the research questions consist of you know, what will be the direct impact of the African continent of free trade agreements on biodiversity. And then we also ask what is the indirect effect in terms of um, what's the product effects, the scale effects, and the structural um, effects of the agreements. And then the, the qualitative aspect looks at you know, the consumer's characteristics and motivation for consuming specific products with adverse effects on biodiversity. So these are the three um, key research questions of the study. Um, thanks to uh, Next slide, please. So the objective is to actually quantify this direct effect of the future agreements of biodiversity um, using simulation methods, because um, this is something that we has not been fully implemented still in these uh, early stages. So it's we're going to use our simulation techniques, which I'll go a little bit later. Um, and also, the, another objective is to estimate um, the indirect effect in terms of its effects on um, biodiversity in line with production, consumption, and, uh, and income. And then the qualitative uh, side of consumer characteristics um, and consumer specific you know, products with adverse effects. On biodiversity. Next slide, please. So our methodology is mixed methods. You know, we are applying both the quantitative method, method, uh, methodology and the qualitative one. Uh, we're going to apply a computable general equilibrium model. Will be used to simulate this impact of this retail area on production, consumption, and uh, income. These are the three key um, variables. Uh, it will be based on the GTAL analysis of changes in the, in the sectoral factor demand and as well as inputs uh, and outputs changes. So essentially, um, we have a set of variables, of variables, economic variables, and um, what its CG model does is um, to um, put a shock in the system, which is uh, what the, the, the policy implementation does. And then we'll now see how um, that affects um, key economic um, variables. Um, but in the qualitative side, we'll do field surveys and focus group discussions uh, with key stakeholders to capture the socioeconomic, demographic, and cultural, as well as, as, well as um, institutional factors um, that might drive uh, the, the preferences for consuming goods uh, with negative effects on biodiversity. Next slide, please. Um, we have two main data sources. The secondary data is from UNCTAD and GTAP. Uh, this is the data is available, we've used it before, um, but the one that will be of, of you know, that will involve uh, some careful um, survey strategies, the primary data, uh, two field surveys, and key information. Next slide, please. So it, it, this is the CGE model framework. Um, it involves um, you know, data on households, the government, and the, and, and the private sector. Um, and the key, uh, key variables like uh, taxation, um, prices, um, uh, sales income. So it shows the interrelatedness between these key um, um, economic variables and, uh, and, and so the next slide please next slide so this is essentially explaining this process um, so we have a baseline data you know from GTA um, on, by the left hand side you can see estimates of consumption uh, for example you can say it's alpha trade flow in beta and the uh, use of factors of production uh, and then transportation so we have estimates of this in the data for a particular year. And then we impose um, this um, uh, uh, the, the shock 
um, in terms of the African Confederate Future Agreement implementation, um, through the structural accounting metric SAM, uh, we impose a decrease in tariffs, an increase in production, an increase in trade, and um, the outcome variable, the outcome will now be how it affects, you know, of these same um, variables that we have in, in the baseline, uh, we we intend to see different estimates of that, which will now be how it affects, you know, the SRB. Next slide, please. Yes, two, two minutes to go. Two minutes to go. Okay, so um, in terms of innovation and originality, um, while there's been a lot of uh, debate on how to implement the actual consent of free trade, um, this study uh, will bring in a biodiversity and go to it. Um, you know, and using mixed methods, we will be able to capture what will be the real effect of this on, on, on biodiversity using. Um, um, the appropriate methods of CGE and that, as well as conjunction uh, analysis. Next slide, please. But there is a, a very uh, a very important policy challenge here. There is a trade off between pursuing industrialization in Africa, which is a key policy uh, goal in Africa, and promoting diversity. How do you reconcile these two? Um, policy objectives. Um, it, it also is also related to um, the energy transition agreement, whereby countries are being asked to move from uh, uh, energy options that increase CO two emissions um, and transmit to renewable energy. While you know, whereby it does not align with the industrialization uh, agenda. You know, so the key policy challenge uh, within. Moving this, moving this kind of research into policy is how to reconcile these two, um, you know, uh, objectives that seem to have you know, um, trade offs in each other. Uh, next slide, please. So, in essence, this, um, yeah. um, this, this is the last slide. So, this um, study is expected to influence policy that will create um, the argument for a sustainable trade environment in Africa. Um, advocate for sustainable production and, and sustainable consumption and through a uh, rigorous dissemination um, uh, strategy we will be able to push um, for the conservation of biodiversity um, in the agreement for promoting a free trade area in Africa. Next slide is there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Chukuga, for, for, for this very clear presentation. Uh, I'd like to invite the, the um, jury members to, to switch on the video and, and start ask uh, questions. Who would like to start? Question and comments. May I ask a question? Yeah, on the sun, please go ahead. And then Maria. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for very timely uh, that the research, which Africa is now embarking on the uh, that. Uh, FC, uh, at ACTA, uh, uh, FCT, uh, uh, Continental Free Trade Area. Uh, my question is, um, what is the assumption on the speed or scale of this uh, trade liberalization under your model? Because this may have a different implication on the um, those causal that the relationship. Sorry, I didn't get your question at all. Please, be, if you can carry it with yourself. So. Sorry, you didn't get the question? Okay. I didn't get it at all. Yeah, can you hear me? It's better now. Okay, yeah. What is the assumption of the speed and also scale of trade liberalization? at the continental level because this may have an implication of a causal effect relationship of your analysis on the CG framework. Okay, so good question. So um, the speed and scale of trade liberal on the free trade and implementation of the free trade agreement um, out of 53 countries in Africa about 45 you know, has, have signed the agreement and also their implementation um, um, stage. Um, but it, it's it's 
It doesn't mean that it has been fully implemented. There are different phases of implementation um, for, for you to uh, consider Africa a completely free trade um, area. It took the EU 72 years to achieve a completely free trade area. So it is uh, a work in progress. Um, however, there is um, the key thing is that you know, there will be a, a, a phase out decrease in tariffs. Uh, um, trade facilitation that has begun in different countries, and uh, we are Africa is moving toward the free trade area. So we consider that to be uh, happening in phases. And um, how does that affect um, uh, the, the research? Is that um, we will impose a shock um, in different scales, you know, so that the intensity of the shock we we'll look at it, um, whereby there is a, 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 a a complete um, removal of, of tariffs and then a gradual reduction um, mm -hmm. in tariffs and we compare those. those I see. Okay. So you have a several different scenario of the extent of trade liberalization, yeah, as I understand. Thank you very much. Yeah. And Peter, you want to come next? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, don't you want to zero in on a specific chapter? of the FTA because I think to analyze the FTA as such may be too broad, no? Like for example, zeroing on some specific tariff lines and what goods that will impact on biodiversity. That's one. And then uh, I'm, I'm curious as to how, I think you mentioned in your proposal, how your, out, how your uh, research results will contribute to the achievement of circular economy, no? So of course, in your presentation, you seem to have scaled it down to sustainable trade, uh, sustainable production and consumption. But I think uh, you should, I like your your ambition no? to aim for circular economy. Now, how will you do that? Thank you. Then I'm afraid we lost our presenter again. This is, a <laughs> this is very unfortunate. Uh, um... I'll see you. He's back. Oh, ah, okay, okay. Yeah, this appears on the screen, so a moment of panic. This panel was cursed. But yeah, this is why. Did you hear the, the, the question of Elpidio? Was that a question or a comment? Well, it's up to you how you would respond because I would have liked you to zero in on what specific chapter because I'm a lawyer. I'm more into the document. Which part of the document have you zeroed in? in your research because it seems like you're just looking at the free trade area in general and for me that's too broad so well perhaps you may want to zero in on what chapter no? like for example uh, I'd like to connect it to my second question you you are aiming to, to achieve circular economy outcomes. so as, is there a chapter in the FTA that incentivizes these outcomes that will help you achieve the sustainable uh, circular economy outcomes that you put out in your proposal. So how? It's a question of how. Yeah. What's well, your entry point, basically, to, to into this yeah. the agreement that is being discussed? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. Did you get my uh, question? Yes. Um, uh, before I understand what you asked, uh, are you asking about, did you say that um, look at Africa is entirely too broad or what aspects? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, this is a, a more of a data um, giving um, exercise. Um, GTAP has, has, has a lot of um, economic variables on most African countries. And CG um, model is just to impose a, a shock on those variables uh, and estimate what will be like the effect. Uh, where that would um, is the qualitative side that that um, issue of, of scale from quantitative? Africa is a very broad country. Might have to select um, regional representatives um, to be able to uh, gauge the, the qualitative effect in terms of engagement. I understand that Africa is too broad, and I might have to. Uh, um, select uh, key regional representatives. 
So how will they obtain sustainable or circular economy outcomes? The results of your research. Can you just explain? Well, the results of um, so in, in, I think in terms of the policy contribution is to bring to, to the arguments and the debate about the effect of the trade area, um, the biodiversity um, effect. Because now we will we'll be able to quantify the effect. You know, the same way um, there were estimations that quantified the you know, benefits of the agreement in terms of increase in GDP, um, percent in increase in trade, we'll be able to quantify this, um, uh, the effects of diversity in terms of um, CO2 emissions, in terms of loss of plants and animal life, and bring that to, to, the, to, the, to the current policy um, um, debates on the effects of so that's the, the kind of policy contribution that we're going to Thank you, thank you, thank you. Marianne, do you want to go next? Sure, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Chikoka. Um, as you said, it can't really get more topical than looking at this particular trade agreement. <laughs> so I was really delighted to see uh, this proposal. Um, you are proposing to do modeling in your research, and obviously that is really interesting. So I'm just gonna dive into, into that straight in with my, my question. So what I would like to understand better is how from your modeling, from your GTAP results, which as far as I understand, will give you quantitative information about the um, carbon, um, carbon emissions, pollution, also, there was, I think you mentioned uh, land use change. So you'll get that kind of quantitative information from your GTAP model. But how are you going to then translate that into biodiversity impacts? So from pollution to biodiversity impacts, to, to climate impacts, to biodiversity impacts. Um, and what kind of biodiversity aspects are you specifically going to be planning to be looking at? Um, so species, ecosystem services, or, or what? So that's my question. So leaping from those quantitative um, results of the modeling into biodiversity uh, impacts more specifically, could you explain that interface um, and that um, that outcome a bit more detailedly? Right. So what what we do in, in the CG modeling is that um, we have different um, economic indicators. And biodiversity, we will have a set of indicators um, that will proxy for biodiversity. It is it will be completely clear at this stage, um, but we know that um, you know um, CO two emissions. Um, it's it's one of the key variables that um, measure that could be to have indirect effect on uh, on, on biodiversity. So it's the ability um, to um, capture variables that are proxy for um, biodiversity. This is work in progress. I cannot say exact variables now. And then if you impose a shock um, on the model, we'll now be able to measure um, the effect of, of that shock, uh, which in this case is the future and the implementation on those um, variables. So, in the course of the modeling and uh, and the data, we'll be able to uh, know the variables that will capture uh, biodiversity. It's not completely clear at this point. Yeah. So you basically you said you you, you said you use you use proxies that you can get out of it, and then Absolutely. I assume that's where you get the causal chain analysis that you mentioned in your proposal comes in. So yes. you try to understand the causal chain. So then. Um, impact on biodiversity. Fantastic. Thank you. I had, yeah, yeah. I had plenty of other questions because I find this a very interesting proposal, but I do want to be uh, mindful of other jury panelists, so I'm just going to pass it on. And uh, luckily, uh, LPD also actually asked also one of my other questions on the circular economy, so uh, you know, at least we're complementing one another. So I hand over to the next panelist. <laughs> Thanks, Marianne. Alan, please come in. Um, uh, uh, Chikua, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to sort of follow up or actually track back from Marianne's question. How is it that GTAP generates 
estimates about climate, uh, CO2 outputs and pollution um, from the model, you know, essentially driven by changes in tariffs. And in particular, how, where does that information come from? Is it specific to Nigeria or what? So, so GTOP is, is um, a data set um, that is being uh, sourced from Onkat. Yeah. Um, they have um, like broad estimates from continental level for Africa, uh, for water use, you know, energy and environment and, and variables. And um, so, so that is the, the, the actual source of, uh, of the data. But uh, it's more complicated. It has matrices that we need to consider because the um, CG model is a model that interacts um, uh, you know, with um, different factors and, and, and be able to show in sort of matrices how increase in prices uh, and uh, tariffs uh, will affect. Uh, uh, sure. But let me be a bit more precise then. So, so GTAP has a series of multipliers on the output changes, basically. It just converts a ton of steel into so much carbon or so much pollution. The data set has some data, it has some multipliers and coefficients. I'm asking, in a sense, where do they come from? Are they global? Do they refer to North America? Are they Africa wide? Or for you, the key question is, do they refer to Nigeria? Since you are, you know, aiming to get hold of the effect on Nigeria. Okay, so it's quite a comprehensive variable um, data set. They have global variables, they have African variables, they have Nigeria and other countries in that um, variable. So it's quite a comprehensive data set. Okay, um, so I guess I'm interested to know who, you know, where they come from. Um, is there, you know, are they calculated by a Nigerian researcher on Ni no, Nigerian no. technology? You know, is different from South African technology, from you know Cambodian technology. So it's 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 a, 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 a data set such as the you know, for example, the World Development Indicators computed by um, the World Bank. On top computes um, the GTA. Digital resource from Alta, uh, which is a United Nations agency that computes um, uh, these data sets. Yeah. Well, okay. okay. Thanks. I, I'm, I think this is the question is absolutely relevant. I'm not, I'm not sure we have time to discuss it more, but uh, um, I think it's something to, to note. Uh, uh, definitely, Chikuka. Um Now, Abdul, we'll come back to you at the end after the. the, the the last the last presentation if you don't mind i'd like to to move to to the third finalist um who's roger merino um and his project titled global amazon harmonizing development visions and multi-scalar interventions in the building of a pluriversal governance roger Hi. Hi. you have 15 Hi. minutes and Jean is gonna just pull up your presentation and share it yeah, yes, thank you very much. I'm trying to share my presentation, but I think it's not working. Just let me Jean check. Will, uh, Jean, uh, my colleague Jean should be able to, to, to put it on the screen for us. Yeah, maybe it's yes. yeah. better. I can see it. Okay, so let's start. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Roger Merino. I'm the main researcher for this research project. Um, this is a, a project about the Amazonia in, the, in South America. So this is a, a global or a, an international area shared by nine uh, countries that is very rich in biodiversity and a very important source of international trade. So next, please. Um, we will discuss the rationale of the project, the ideas, the evidence, and the policy outcome uh, that we expect to obtain from this project. Next, please. Uh, the rationale, as I mentioned, the Amazon is both an area very rich for uh, international trade, 
uh, very important for the, the economic development of a basin countries, but at the same time, it's a, a crucial area for fighting climate, climate change. Uh, next, please. Um, the Amazon is shared by nine Amazonian countries. The largest are Brazil, uh, Peru, and Colombia. Uh, it's a global uh, reservoir of uh, a carbon reservoir. It's a global climate regulator. At the same time, is the area where commodities uh, are extracted uh, for agribusiness, uh, minerals, uh, cattle farming, and so on. So it is crucial for climate, for international trade as well. Next, please. Uh, but the problem is that uh, these uh, economic interventions in the area uh, are uh, generating a very deep impact. So the, 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 the forest, deforestation rates are really uh, worrisome in, in the last years in the Amazon, and we are reaching a typing point uh, in this very important area for the world. So we need to balance the need for economic development and international trade on the one hand, and the need to protect biodiversity on the other hand. Uh, next, please. Um, uh, this is a governance problem because each nation state in the Amazon uh, enact their own economic, and environmental, and social policies over their specific Amazonian area. And by enacting this, these specific policies, uh, we have at the end a very fragmented scenario. Uh, and at the same time, the most powerful stakeholders are those who influence those policies. So the big agribusiness, uh, big mining uh, and hydrocarbon companies are the, the most uh, the most that influence the, the policy process and the local and uh, indigenous communities are usually taking not taking into account so the the research question is how to harmonize the different interests in the amazon how to balance the different economic objective environmental objective in this very important area. Next, please. So let's talk about ideas. Well, what are the theories has been discussed about the nature of the Amazon and how to govern the Amazon? Um, next, please. Uh, one idea of the Amazon is the Amazon as a site of a global extraction. So this is a historical idea of the Amazon. We have envision the Amazon as a place to extract resources, commodities, and to trade internationally. At the same time, it's a place to explore, to uh, implement huge uh, infrastructure projects, to connect different countries, and to connect these countries to international trade. So the Amazon as a site of global extraction, as I mentioned, the other side of this view of the Amazon is Forest degradation is local environmental injustice, among other other uh, critical effects. Uh, the other idea of the Amazon is the Amazon as a global concern, and here we are in the in the field of international law. When we talk about the Amazon as a site of a global extraction, the main scholarly discussion is in the field of political ecology. Here we are in the field of international law. Um, there are different ideas or principles that discuss how we should govern the Amazon. For example, if we understand the Amazon as a global common, it's very different if, if we understand the Amazon as a global, um, as an international common. If the Amazon is an international common under international law, the, the only voice to govern the Amazon is the, is the nine nation states. So they have the only responsibility to govern the Amazon. But if the Amazon is a global common, all countries in the world will have a right to uh, say something about how to govern the Amazon. So this is an international law discussion that we also will discuss in this project. Next, please. And the other discussion is the Amazon as a 
as a site of global governance. So how we should govern the, 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 the Amazon, considering, considering that there are different scales at a local, regional, national, uh, international scale, different actors, public, private, different uh, standards, legal standards of law, hard law. Um, how we can govern this very complex uh, scenario? So the main uh, theory is polycentricity, and this theory has been applied in practice. And this uh, basically argues that uh, it, there are very different scales when we talk about global commons, but even the most specific and localized scales uh, might produce positive effects at, uh, and then escalate at different levels. For example, uh, a specific uh, development project to support a specific community uh, might be then replicated to other communities and then escalate and generate positive impact. So this is polycentricity that's very important when we talk about environmental governance and development, but this project uh, challenges this theory a bit because we, we want to emphasize the need of a more holistic approach to international, uh, to international governance of the Amazon. Next, please. Um, when we talk about evidence, uh, we have very important uh, evidence and studies about the, the, the deforestation rates of the Amazon, uh, the, the environmental problems of the Amazon, the environmental impacts of the Amazon, but politicians usually don't follow this recommendation and this evidence. So, and, and actually we have less evidence about how to better govern the Amazon. So what are the, the necessary reforms at the policy level to implement for the Amazon? So this project, next please, aims at obtaining evidence for improving the international governance of the Amazon. So the main methodology is qualitative. It is based on in-depth interviews to international actors, uh, case studies, documentary analysis, and the quantitative aspect of the research is to analyze also the data from a, a international investment database and human rights database over the Amazon. Um, this is uh, mainly qualitative because we need to understand how the different actors at different levels interact and, and, and how they can uh, make agreements to improve this governance. Next, please. And the main international actor is the Amazon Cooperation Trade Organization, the ACTO. It is the international supra organization that supposedly should enact international principle for the Amazon among the named Amazonian countries. However, it is very, it's a very weak organization. It in practice has no uh, approved any international standard. And um, basically it has served as a space for sharing information and to promote mega infrastructure projects, but not uh, environmental standards. Next, please. And the other important organization is the coordinator of indigenous organization of the Amazon River Basin, the COICA. This is the, one of the most important uh, indigenous organization in the world. It represents the indigenous people of the um, nine Amazonian countries. Um, but the problem is the COICA has no space, has no voice at the ACTO. So it has no formal representation of the governance of the Amazon. Next, please. Uh, other actors, very important, obviously, are the governments. Uh, the main governments that this uh, project is going to uh, uh, research are the, the largest in, in Amazonian territory. This is Brazil, Peru, and Colombia. In these countries, also, there are very important uh, international projects for uh, developing infrastructures and uh, extractive activities in the Amazon. Next, please. And the cases, uh, we will focus on the initiative for the integration of the regional infrastructure of South America. This is, uh, is called IRSA. It's 
actually a bunch of infrastructure projects, ports, highways, uh, among others, that seeks to connect the uh, Amazonian countries and then connect these countries to international flows for improving international trade. So the, the IRSA has uh, already generated very important impacts in environmental terms, deforestation and conflict at local level. So we, we will uh, understand how these projects might be governed with a uh, at the international level with, with a new uh, reform of the act, And also other important project is the Bell and Road Initiative. The BRI is impulsed by China. That's a very ambitious uh, worldwide plan for infrastructure. Um, in, in Latin America, some countries have already engaged with the BRI. For example, Brazil is implemented some uh, dam projects under the BRI umbrella. And also this project seeks to uh, implement or promote international trade. So we are looking to understand how these different international actors might uh, interact and, uh, and promote or, or, or be governed under an uh, international governance of the Amazon to better uh, supervise this kind of mega infrastructure project that promote international trade. Next, please. The policy outcome then is uh, or is related to how to uh, consider all the actors the, at the different levels in the governance of the Amazon. One of the most important actors are the indigenous people. They live in the Amazon, but their voice is not usually considered. Next, please. Uh, so we need a, a pluriversal and plurinational governance in the Amazon. And this means that indigenous people and the nature itself shouldn't be considered as mere symbols, but as an international actor. And this requires a reform of the governance structure of the act, the reform of the decision making process, and uh, to thinking about regional and social standard to uh, govern the international trade, international investment in the Amazon. In some, this implies reimagining and reinventing this international organization. In next, please. And um, that's One all. Minute to go, ah. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly the time. Thank you. This is the team. We are three people. Uh, we have been researching the Amazon for several years and Thank you again for the opportunity to stay here. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thanks to you for, for the cl clear presentation and our project. I'd like to invite the, the, the screen. Some background noise. Okay, we went. Um, who would like to start? Yes, Elpidio, please go ahead. We cannot hear you. No. We can hear you. The mic is on, but it's not sure the mic. Hello? 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 We hear a lot of background noise, but not really your voice. No, still nothing. Okay. Anybody else wants to go while video? Alan? Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, Roger. I enjoyed the presentation very much. Very informative. I've got one question. It's a big question, and that is, you're proposing to sort of set all of this stuff in um, an intellectual framework that feels very convincing to people like us. How are you going to persuade Bolsonaro, everyone's favorite politician, to reform the actor? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Alan for. Sorry, there is some. Sorry, there is some. 
Yeah, can I ask everyone to, to mute yourself uh, while you're not speaking so that we avoid background noise? Thank you. Please go so, ahead. Thank, thank you very much, Alan. This is a, a crucial question, uh, how to persuade this international uh, politician. So how, how persuade politician and officials. So uh, we are planning to, to interview a key politician, officials at the different governments at the, at the, at the ACTO, and then, then to promote some a discussion table at the ACTO. So we hope to do that uh, um, and put on the table uh, the, the finding of this project um, and then to make a strong networks with activists uh, with NGOs and to put on the agenda this issue because this issue is not in on the agenda yet and we are we are not sure if we in the in the short term we can persuade this the these politicians so this is very difficult indeed but if we can put on the agenda on the international discussion this issue we think we are contributing to uh, push this type of reform so these are long-term struggles. So this is not as some, something that we draft a law and then we put in the Congress. No, these are very long-term struggles, but we think that with very important networks, uh, with the support of uh, allies, international NGOs, we, put, uh, we, we can move uh, forward towards this kind of reform. So this actually is a, a medium term uh, uh, goal i will say it a medium or long term go, uh, uh, goal but we can start from now i think this is <laughs> the way thank you roger uh, marianne had, had asked to speak and then of course on thank you um thank you uh roger also from my side i like you and i i, I like your vision and i applaud your vision is 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 very holistic and comprehensive and very bold uh, as well, how to change the situation or, or increase sustainability. Um, my question is very much linked to the call for these proposals, which was about trade and biodiversity specifically. I understand that in your proposal, trade is one of the drivers for change um, and sustainability in Amazon region. But um, more specifically, how does your proposal contribute to the trade policy space? Um, so. As the outcomes, you know, are there some specific contributions, recommendations, ideas that we could then take into how to reform trade policies, um, or perhaps you know, not even if not trade policy, but then trade-related policy that will be supporting more sustainable trade. Thank you very much. Usually, uh, trade policies in the Amazons are seen as the area of, uh, of fair trade, corporate social responsibility some uh, forest certifications. So these are fragmented trade policies. And very, very, are very uh, soft uh, standards. So it's related to corporate uh, own policies. So when we think about the act as a new, uh, or as a reformed international uh, uh, organizations uh, that includes indigenous people and nature itself as international actor, we also think a new standard, regional standard for trade and international investment. So this is, I think, a, a very important issue because fair trade or specific policies are also fragmented policies. If we have regional standard for trade uh, that focuses, for example, on the, on the chains of production and distributions, a specific requirements for companies to uh, buy uh, product from local communities, but not uh, just depending on, on each company, but at the regional level. So we can uh, uh, make a very important, a very important contribution to trade as an international policy. So this is one of the issues that, that we want to put on the agenda when we talk about the act of as an inter as a regional uh, organizations and this is a call also from indigenous communities and indigenous people so indigenous people around the amazon region they want development but in a sustainable way 
So when we talk about trade, they, they, they talk about trade with that ensures their social and economic development as well. So we, if we can imagine a, 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 a trade in these terms at a regional and holistic uh, perspective. So I think we can contribute. And this is one of the goals of the project. Onasan, we would like to come in now. Thank you very much. A very beautiful presentation. I think my question is also related to the Dr. Alan Winters. Um, I think that uh, your analysis, the approach is uh, very much comprehensive in a, and also that the various methodology of the, the deep stakeholder consultation and the interviews. Uh, my question is that uh, when, as a research analysis, you want to maybe harmonize the various perspectives to the priority actions what kind of maybe uh, maybe objective method you would like, you are planning to utilize because there will be various diversified views and perspective in the different actors and different level and how do you want to harmonize those perspectives in terms of interpreting into the concrete policy action this is my question yeah Thank you very much. Um, yeah, how we we might harmonize this interest. So the field step is to identify the key relevant actors at the different levels, uh, then to make the interviews with each of these relevant actors, to make a, to make a database of interviews and to, to find the, the connections between the, the interests, the concerns, the, the the ideals of these different actors, of course, we will find some contradicting views, for example, between the, the governments and the local communities or between the NGOs or the companies and local communities. But then we should focus on these uh, red areas where there are some conflicts and promote some uh, policy reforms about these specific areas where the conflict uh, uh, emerged. Um, obviously, the idea of harmonize or balance is an ideal, so it's what we want to do. Uh, but at the end, we want to make recommendations, and the policy makers and the politician uh, will discuss if the recommendation will work for, for them. So maybe they will say, OK, thank you, but we are happy what we are doing now but for that reason it's also important to make very important uh, very strong uh, networks with activists uh, and indigenous organization to uh, put this uh, in agenda as well so i totally agree so we need to uh, think about to harmonize this balance maybe this is so uh, a medium term uh, goal but we can start from now with this database of information about the, the, where the people, or where the organization agree uh, and, and where there's no agreements. So this is a qualitative analysis with interview with ma, uh, data mining, for example, to, under, to identify this, this, uh, this point of these issues. Yes, uh, basically that is, is, is a, is a a very qualitative and documentary analysis and then to promote these tables to discuss with the organizations thank you Roger. El elpidio are, are you able to were you able to fix the problem with the audio you want to come in now no we can still still cannot hear you Can you try to maybe unplug your, your, your headset? No? That's a pity. But Peter, why don't you write your question in the chat box? So we can still ask them to, to Roger. Last chat. Can you hear that? Uh, we can hear some. Yeah, J just go ahead. Just go ahead. I'm just not, uh... How do you make sure 
that the indigenous peoples will be uh, treated equally by the governments. So, so I think, I think in, in the, the, the Amazon. Really it's highly distorted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can follow because it's highly distorted somehow. You just write it in the chat box. And that's that. I think it is in the chat box. I guess I just type it, I just type it. So how will you ensure that governments will recognize the indigenous people in the governance of the Amazon? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Elpidio. Uh, governments already, already have recognized indigenous people's rights. They have recognized the rights to free, prior, and informed consent, uh, some uh, territorial rights. So there are some recognitions at national level of indigenous rights. The problem is implementation of these rights in most cases. Um, there is a growing, uh, uh, I will say, uh, taking of responsibilities of indigenous people for, from governments. But this, this process uh, is emerging because indigenous people are organizing better and I they are demanding the right to be recognized. So I think this is a wave, this is a process, and this, pro this project is going to contribute to this, to this process, but at the international level. COICA already, this international Indian organization, already is very, a very important actor at, at, the, at the level of uh, lobbying, of international policies and standards, but it needs a formal, formal incorporation of these international uh, bodies. So uh, I think the project is, is going to, to, to give to this uh, international actor as COICA the tools to, to, to go at international forums and going governments and say, here there is evidence that, that we can do some reforms to act that include, include us as an international actor. So the, the project is a tool, I will say, for this, in, for this uh, organization for indigenous people. So in, the project will ensure that the people will be included, but this look, it's a retroalimentation, it's a, it's, it's a way that uh, can support this, this demand that we consider that is, uh, is a just demand, is a fair demand for these communities. So I will say that. So this, this will, will, will help the, 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 these people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I think, I think now uh, it's time to be, we go back to Abdul. Thank you very much for, for, for a clear answer, a clear presentation. Uh, we'll go Thank back you. to Abdul because it's connected. Uh, Abdul, can you, oh, perfect. Yeah, Okay, we can see you and hear you. Um, and let, let, let's let's uh, you know continue the conversation, which was abruptly interrupted by uh, by your connectivity. Um, I think Alan was uh, speaking, if I am not mistaken. Yeah, if I can okay. uh, pick up. Um, so, yes. Abdel, uh, thank you for your presentation an hour ago. And, thank uh, you. I I got some sort of two related questions. Let me put them both together. The first is, how do you define biodiversity? And in particular, over what sort of span of area? Is it at the village level, the community level, the county level, or what have you? So I'm interested in, in, in how we get our hands around biodiversity as a sort of, if you like, a national problem. The related question is, if you have a fairly broad definition of biodiversity, how do you think your, um, the participants in your surveys and your focus groups are going to be able to will be informed about it and, and understand that issue? Uh, typically, when we deal with individuals, we ask them, what happened to you? What did you experience? 
but most of their experience is very limited geographically. So it's sort of spanning, you know, that, that divide is biodiversity is geographically large and you're talking to people in the small. How do you sort of span those two? Yes, thank you so much uh, for that question. Um, biodiversity here, um, we are referring to uh, plant and animal life, um, their genetic uh, species and ecosystem diversity. So, but in this instance, we are focusing on um, the plant uh, species because it is usually the species that are affected by um, activities of large-scale agricultural investors. Usually when they acquire such land, they have to clear uh, some of the trees and plants at the farm level in order to make way for their activities. So usually it is the plants that are directly affected. So that is why we decided to focus on only the plant species. More to the point, um, once the plant species are affected, then the, um, the uh, animal species are also affected because that serves as their um, habitat. So that is why we are focusing on the plant species. So in short, biodiversity involves a lot. It includes the plant and animal life, their um, genetic species, and then ecosystem diversity. But we are focusing on plant uh, species since they are what is directly affected. Now coming to the question of um, which level I am going to conduct this study, we are looking at it at the farm household level. So um, usually it is um, the farm household level, it is their land that are acquired and then cleared to make way for large scale agricultural investment. So usually um, we will ask the farmers um, whether they have lost land through such large scale agricultural investment and what are some of the things they lost on the farm. That is whether their plants were cleared and if their plants were cleared, whether they had some particular trace on the, um, the area that they were cultivating and what amount of trace were cleared due to large scale agricultural investment. Thank you, uh, Mariana. Hello, uh, thank you, Abdul. It was a very well written proposal and I very much liked how clear you were constantly, how you were contributing to the existing body of evidence, uh, which made it you know, very nice and easy to read from a, from a reviewer's perspective and also convincing in that respect. So thank you for that. Um, my thank question you. follows specifically from Alan's, as I wanted to put my hand up immediately. Um, so I now understand better what aspects of biodiversity you're looking at in terms of focusing on plant species and taking it from there. But you also mentioned ecosystem services. So I wanted to then ask you already, you know, so which types of ecosystem services you will be looking at, because, of course, obviously, through ecosystem services, you also get to the more socioeconomic impacts of these uh, large scale investments. Um, and through that also argumentation as to, you know, how we should and would make them more sustainable. So that is my question. Thank you. OK, yes. Um, with ecosystem services, we are looking at usually um, the, um, the, the, the biodiversity or the plant at the farm level, we usually have uh, plant species such as um, the shear nuts. We have the shear nuts, then we have um, other plant uh, tree species, which are usually used by the farmers. For instance, they pick shear nuts from the, um, the, 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 the shear trees. We have cuckoo plants, which they use, they harvest, and then we also have hunt, hunting, they also use the is the forest species for hunting, which is all found at the farm level. So usually when these species are cleared, when these species are cleared, farmers usually lose access to such uh, services. Like this forest usually provide them with shear nuts, firewood, charcoal, and other uh, benefits. So we usually when all these things are cleared, farmers lose access to them. So in short, we are looking at ecosystem services, including whether farmers are able to access firewood from the, um, their farm or the forest, or whether they are able to um, generate um, charcoal from their farm. So that is what exactly we mean by ecosystem services. You're looking at the provisioning services um, on a broader yes, scale as the farm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of the ecosystem yeah. services. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. I'd like to come in a Honosan, please. Thank you very much for your very um, that uh, 
interesting proposal and also very innovative methodology. Uh, I understand you're going to have a very large household survey by utilizing at the, uh, the Kobo tool books uh, for the northern Ghana, which is maybe very much scattered uh, the, 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 the population. So um, my question is, uh, could you explain more in detail about the kinds of uh, questions you're going to ask for this um, large household survey and how you're going to go around? This is my first question. The second question is, um, um, uh, is about that the, uh, I think uh, agricultural development is a very important uh, for particularly African countries. And then are you going to also investigate what will be a maybe measures to ensure that, that, that the balance, sustainable agriculture, not only negative aspect, what would be a maybe uh, that the measures which could bring win-win solutions? Uh, I just wanted to ask this question. Yes. Um, the first question is clear, but um, the second question is not. Mm. Yes, I'm not clear about the second question. Are you good? Okay. Are you so yeah. are you are you asking how um, large scale agricultural investment and biodiversity will bring a win win situation to both investors yeah. and host communities? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So for the first question, questions um, will be generated from you know I I mentioned that we have in our methodology we have three stages. That is the first phase, uh, key informant interviews. So um, questions for the household service will be coming from um, the results of the key informant interviews. So um, for the key informant interviews, after analysis, we will now categorize our data into teams or responses into teams. Then based on the, um, the, the frequencies and then the percentages, there will surely be some teams that will be uh, dominating in the key informant interviews. So, and which means that these are the, some of the teams that is usually uh, most concerned to um, farmers. So we'll pick such teams and based on such teams, questions will be generated for the household survey. So, um, so the, and, the quest, and these questions will just revolve around biodiversity and the large scale agricultural investment. Okay, then um, when you talk about the win-win situation, we look, we, we want to, um, after generating of the results, then um, our policies, uh, because we, we will have both um, stakeholders that will be joining in this project. So first we will have um, usually the households who are taking part in the project. Then we'll have, uh, what do you call it? We'll have uh, the investors who will also be interviewed then we'll have government officials who are also going to be interviewed. So in the end, um, it will be clear how such investments are affecting biodiversity and what are some of the, um, um, the key um, uh, uh, what solutions that will be um, adopted in order to solve such problem. And this will be a win-win situation for all the parties involved. And also, once this uh, large-scale agricultural investment, once their impacts are identified, then um, investors will have to sit down with government officials to find a way of how to help uh, compensate the farmers so that farmers will also benefit from the large scale agricultural investment activities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, because for example, land that uh, registration, the land issue re requires a lot of a kind of a land titling or land that the uh, registration and those legal framework too so i just wanted yes. to yeah yeah understand how you are, you are planning here yeah. okay thank you uh, abdul uh, el Pido is still having connectivity issue but he, he, he pace he wrote these questions in the chat box um, okay so the first question is what sort of biodiversity specific guidelines are you foreseeing from the results of your study that will minimize the adverse impacts of lsai's on biodiversity the second question is, don't you think your geographic scope may be too broad? Uh, you may want to compress the area coverage uh, and still come up with good results, like zeroing in on one biodiversity rich area or one biodiversity deficient area. Okay, so um, regarding the first question, um, 
we do not have guidelines uh, concerning biodiversity, but we only have guidelines for large scale agricultural uh, transactions or large scale agricultural investment. We have guidelines for that. That is prepared by the Ghana's Ministry of Food and Agriculture and as well as the Lands Commission. They have all come up with guidelines on how to acquire large hectares of land for um, such investment. But there is no specific document that looks at uh, biodiversity uh, issues. The only document that is uh, a bit related to such issues is uh, the policy document for wildlife and forestry, and which does not specify how um, such biodiversity will be used. So um, our outcomes, we hope, will uh, help policymakers uh, include such dimension in the in the policy document for wildlife and forestry. Now, talking about the second question, um, yes, I had wanted to limit it, but um, the results will not be applicable to all because we have um, five regions we are talking about here, which have different geographic um, and demographic uh, characteristics. And so um, just zeroing down to only one uh, area and getting results will not be applicable to other areas. So that is why we have decided to uh, broaden the scope of the mm -hmm. study. Okay, thank you very much, um, Abdul. Uh, of course, thank you very much to all the presenters and all the uh, jury members. Uh, now, what will happen next is that the jury will actually meet uh, immediately after this meeting to, to deliberate on uh, um, on the award, of course. Uh, just a, a, a logistical note for, for the jury members. Um, you received in your in your email a link to a Zoom meeting. Uh, uh, we'll use Zoom to, to meet uh, as, as a jury. Uh, um, second thing, it would be great if you can send your, your, uh, your grading of the proposals either on the Google Sheet uh, directly uh, or by email uh, um, before you connect to the Zoom meeting. So we can already start with the averages uh, um, in front of us. Um, I'd like to, to, to close uh, the session um, by just inviting everyone to join us tomorrow for the celebration of 20 years of this competition and the announcement of the winners, including, of course, of, of this category uh, at 2 p.m. CET, uh, uh, Central European time, uh, on the same platform. Thank you very much and good luck to the finalists again once more. Thank you. Hi. Obino san, how are we going to do? Uh, are we get out from here two seconds yes uh, yeah. Yeah. We, so, we're going to to there's a link uh, we sent the link a zoom link on your email mm -hmm. uh, okay. so we'll just meet on zoom meet on zoom okay yeah okay okay just a minute yeah. okay I, I can forward the link also to yamamoto san in case yeah yamamoto san please yeah yeah, yeah. hello yamamoto san <laughs> Gracias.